<웃음> A steamship pulls into the harbor, carrying hundreds of immigrants and a surprise for New York City. The surprise is dirt poor, just five feet tall, and hardly speaks a word of English. Her name is Clara Remlich. The girls got grit, and she's going to prove it. Look out, New York. Clara knows in her bones what is right and what is wrong. What's wrong begins a few weeks after the Remliches move into their tenement in America. No one will hire Clara's father. They will, however, hire Clara. That's right, Clara. Companies are hiring thousands of immigrant girls to make blouses, coats, nightgowns, and other women's clothing. They earn only a few dollars a month. But it helps pay for food and rent. So instead of carrying books to school, many girls carry sewing machines to work. Clara becomes a garment worker. From dawn to dusk, she's locked up in a factory. Rows and rows of young women. Bend over their tables, stitching collars, sleeves, and cuffs as fast as they can. Hurry up, hurry up! The boss is here. Clara's machine, the sunless room, is stuffy from all the bodies crammed inside. There are two filthy. Toilets, one sink, and three towers for three hundred girls to share. Clara learns the rules. If you are a few minutes late, you lose half a day's pay. If you prick your finger or and bleed on the cloth, you are fined. If it happens a second time, you are fired. The doors are locked, and you are inspected every night before you leave to be sure haven't stolen anything from the factory. But Clara is uncrushable. She wants to read. She wants to run. At the end of her shift, though her eyes hurt from straining in the gaslight and her back hurts from. Hunching over the sewing machine, she walks to the library. She fills her empty stomach with a single glass of milk and goes to school at night. When she gets home in the in the late evening, she sleeps only a few hours before rising again. As the weeks grind by, Clara makes friends with. The other factory girls at lunch, they share stories and secrets as if they were in school, where they belong. Clara smolders with anger, not just for herself, but for all the factory girls working like slaves. This was not the America she would imagine. The men at the factory tell her they have been trying to get the workers. To team up in a union, they then they would strike, refuse to work until the bosses treat them better. But the men don't think the ladies are tough enough. Not tough enough because they are girls. Oh yes, they are. Clara knows it. She will show them. From then on. At the swing tables and on the street corners, Clara urges the girls to fight for their rights. When the seamstresses are overworked, she says, "Strike." When they are underpaid, she says, "Strike." When they are punished for speaking up, 
she cries, strike, and the girls do. Each time Clara leads a walkout, the bosses fire her. Each time she pickets, her life is in danger. The bosses hire men to beat her and the other strikers. The police arrest her 17 times. They break six of her ribs, but they can't break her spirit. It's shatterproof. Clara hides her bruises from her parents. A few days later, she's on the picket line again. And the other girls think, if she can do it, we can do it too. For weeks, the small strikes go on, but the bosses find her young woman to do the work for the same low pay and long hours. We must do something bigger, think Clara and other union readers. Something huge, a giant strike at every garment factory in the city. The union holds a meeting. Throngs of workers pack the seats, the aisle, the walls, the whole drums with excitement. Clara listens to speech after speech. The speakers, mostly men, want everyone to be careful. Two hours pass. No one recommends a general strike. Finally, the most powerful union leader in the country goes up to the podium. Not even he proposes action, so Clara does. That's right, Clara. She calls out from the front of the hall. The crowd lifts her to the stage where she shouts in Yiddish. I have no further patience for talk. I move that we go on a general strike. And she starts the largest workout, workout of women workers in U.S. history. The next morning, New York City is stunned by the sight of thousands of young women streaming from the factories. One newspaper calls it an army. Others call it a Revolt is a revolt of girls, for some are only 12 years old, and the rest are barely out of their teens. In the coming weeks, Clara is called a hero. She lights up chilly union horse with her fairly pep talks. Her singing lifts the spirits of the picketers. When a group of dogs approaches, she yells, Stand fast, girls. And they do. All winter long, in the bitter cold, in their cheap, thin coats, tired and starving and scared, the girls walk alongside the men on the icy sidewalks of the picket line. They spill out of the union horse, blocking the roads, filling street corners and public squares. Newspapers write stories about them, college girls raise money for them. Rich women, switched in for coach, pick up with the factory girls. By the time the strike is over, hundreds of bosses agree to let their staff from unions. They shorten the work week and raise salaries. The strike and burdens thousands of women to walk out of garment factories in Philadelphia and Chicago. And the strike convinces Clara to keep fighting for the rights of workers. Her throat is hoarse, her feet are sore, but she has helped thousands of people, proving that in America, wrongs can be righted. Warriors can wear scorch and blouses, and the bravest herd may beat in girls only five feet tall.